Number 10. Venom Clint Barton Hawkeye. The Venom symbiote it gets around, but Eddie will always be its true love. This venomized Hawkeye does not come from the Venomverse storyline. Surprise. In this world, Clint was possessed by the symbiote after Mac Gargan, aka the Scorpion, who was rocking it during his tenure on the Dark Avengers. He exists in a reality known as the War Zone, one of the remnants of realities left after the Secret Wars in 2015. This one is an alternate Earth in which the first civil war, because yes, at this time there is more than one, there's two, after the first and better, but still a hot mess civil war never ended. Instead, the country was divided into two sections, one ruled by Tony called the Iron and the other by Cap called the Blue. So Venom Clint was recruited by Spidey to infiltrate the Iron, which he agreed to for revenge, a dish best served through secret stealth operations. Why revenge? Not fully explained, but that's fine. So with this, you have the symbiote's abilities, which of course include the heightened senses and strength, the augmentation of adrenaline and healing factor, the creation slash manifestations of one's violent creations or thoughts, on top of Hawkeye's marksmanship, and in this universe, his rage. The symbiote does well when bonded to someone with anger issues. I guess there are so many Clintar now, I can't just say the symbiote, but I'll always think of Venom first. Number 9. Jewel from Earth 523002. So Jewel is Jessica Jones, a character introduced in Alias, the first outing of the Max Marvel Comics imprint, a place where more adult and brutal stories could be told. In her original arc, Jessica had barely begun her superhero career when she is waylaid by the Purple Man, who takes her as his mind-controlled slave. Until tiring of her, he sicks her on the Avengers, who she attacks in a brainwashed rage, so they brutally beat her into a coma. Upon being aided into wakefulness by Jean Grey, in the original arc, she retires for a time to be a private detective, and spends years sorting through her pain, trauma, and complicated relationship with her abilities. But of course, this is Marvel, so we have What Ifs. This What If from 2005 is called What If Jessica Jones Had Joined the Avengers. In this universe, after awakening from her coma, and being offered a we're sorry we beat you nearly to death spa on the team, she accepts. I'm telling you, they're just offering it out to everybody. She starts her career as an Avenger, and eventually starts a relationship with and marries Captain America. This Avengers team thus gets a strong new member, one ready to fight, with all of Jessica's latent abilities, super strength, flight, durability, and thanks to Jean, telepathic resistance to help her resist the Purple Man in the future. She's low, because in the superhero world, that's a pretty standard power set. Plus, in the main verse, she joins the Avengers later anyways. Number 8. Iron Patriot, Tony Stark. Not Norman Osborn, from Contest of Champions. This version of Tony is so twisted, I kinda love it. So for this, we need to go back to the Illuminati, the superhero team determined to preemptively protect the universe from threats, and Reed's on the team, so you know it can come to no good. In their quest to keep people safe, they hunt down the Infinity Stones to form the Gauntlet, and Reed tried to wish them out of existence. However, the Watcher shows up to tell them that that isn't actually possible, as the universe needs the stones to exist. So instead, the stones are divided amongst the members of the Illuminati. Tony gets the Reality Stone, and this reality, he uses it, and begins subtly shifting reality during civil war in his favor. He saved Steve though, so yay! But he made himself president. Under his tenure he created the Mighty Avengers, and functions as their leader, the Iron Patriot. Through some battle realm maestro Hulk shenanigans, he is separated from his reality stone, but with it, in his home universe, he was a force to be reckoned with. The stones are meant to tempt their users, and this Tony just couldn't resist the pull. The power to do whatever one wants. Good stuff. Good stuff. Number 7. Wanda Maximoff from Earth 10082 famine in this universe. In this universe, the Scarlet Witch has been turned into one of Apocalypse's four horsemen, specifically Famine. Her fellow horsemen in this universe were Wolverine, Spider-Man, and Red Hulk. They appeared as part of the Heroic Age event, and were really just there for a bit of shock, especially for Spider-Man, who was all, oh, me a horseman of the Apocalypse? How could this be? Still, the idea of Scarlet Witch with all of her destructive reality warping, or in some cases destroying powers, combined with augmented powers of one of Apocalypse's horsemen, people would be dropping dead on the spot. But the Avengers still defeat them, cause heroes. Avengers assemble! Number 6. Thunderstrike, Eric Masterson. Now I can see some of your feathers getting ruffled, but stay with me a moment. Eric Masterson is one of the many other characters to take on the mantle of Thor. However, initially when this character appeared, he was Thor. The two were fused together. In fact, it was kind of awful for Eric, because both of their personalities were in there, like an angry thunderous firestorm. However, the two were separated after Thor killed Loki, and was banished. But he begged for Eric, who he had become fond of, to not be left defenseless, especially not after having been Thor. So Heimdall causes Eric to become the new Thor, with all the Thunder God's powers, but this time with his own mind, 100%. He very quickly after, due to fans, let's say feedback, became Thunderstrike, his own character, but still Thor. 
with an axe called Thunderstrike. So he's named after his weapon, basically. Still, it's a solid weapon name. However, for his time as Thor, he was an Avenger with all of Thor's powers, but he was only kind of Thor. Feeling my reach? Put some stretch into it. He did better on his own. I know some of you were mad he was on my worst Avengers list. I still maintain he was better being a secret defender with Rhodey. Yes, you can be strong, and I still want you solo. Bow to my whims. Number five, the MCU's Avengers. They get a mention mid-ranked. I know some don't consider them alternates, but well, they are. The main verse is 616. Everyone else just wishes they were. Well, not really. Some people have way better alternate realities. This team has been one followed by the public and for some is who they think of when they think of the Avengers. They came together to defeat Thanos and solve their version of the Infinity Gauntlet arc, bringing back half the universe. Even after being torn apart by Civil War. Impressive. And a cinematic event to behold. Number four, Natalia Romanova, the Iron Spider of Earth TRN-619. So she's a member of President Stark's Mighty Avengers and had a similar history to her 616 counterpart until things were altered by Tony using the Reality Stone. When Tony picked her to be a member of his team, he gave her the Iron Spider armor. So we have Natasha with all of her training and ruthlessness with an Iron Spider suit because, well, Spider-Man is on the other side. So she gets all the perks that armor has to bring, which is a lot. And she gets to look good doing it. Man, Tony and Pierre's relationship was really messed up by Civil War. Can you imagine now he sees Black Widow in his old armor? Just, well, it's on. Or it would be if this universe hadn't come to an end. Number three, Vampire Avengers. Gotta love a whole team of vampires. Well, you don't, but I do. These Avengers come from Earth 3931 and were all turned by Captain America, who was turned by Baron Blood. In fact, he got turned all the way back during World War II. His Avengers are all his personal slaves. Some people retain their sense of self after they turn, and some people just go full scorched earth. This team went up against the Exiles, and it did not go well. Still, this cap had his serumness plus an additional vampire boost on top. The strength, the mesmerization, the teleportation, he was stacked. It would be nice to see Vamp Cap again. He's like Cap Wolf for me, just more supernatural Steve Rogers. Transformation on top of transformation. Number two, let's stay in the same vein with the Undead Avengers. Yes, there are different types of undead. It encompasses a wide breadth of creatures. These Avengers come from Earth 666. Cute. They've got Frankencastle, which I maintain still sounds like a cereal. So not much is known about this Earth, except that it's made up of supernatural creatures, and the societal structure is based around all these subgroups. And the best of each group united to form these Avengers, as a representation that all these groups could work together and protect this supernatural Earth. Inspiring. And come on, you know a hero team featuring vampires, werewolves, zombies, witches, etc. has got to be awesome. All the bonus damage they can take. And reek. I mean... Are they good? I don't know. Number one, Rogue Danvers. This is actually two characters, let me explain. So this rogue was Carol Danvers, and still kinda is. This character hails from Earth 9289, which was briefly visited by the mainverse Captain Marvel. In this universe, the transference of power between her and Rogue went differently. In this world, Rogue held on too long, well, too long comparatively, and ended up absorbing more than Carol's power, i.e. strength, flight, etc., her memories, and her personality. In fact, she held on so long that Carol did too. It went both ways. And instead of slipping into a coma like she did in the 616 verse, she absorbed Rogue's powers and personality. So in essence, they swapped. So Carol is Rogue and Rogue is Carol. So I'm counting both. We have a nerfed up Captain Marvel post-binary set and Rogue. That's a lot of a lot. Cosmic absorption power. The main verse Carol encounters these two while peering across the multiverse to encounter other versions of herself with the reality stone during Infinity Countdown Captain Marvel. That's a mouthful. And at number 10, Henry Pym. Henry Pym of Earth 12091 is a literal humanoid ant. Pym was a member of the Avengers Federation, an Avengers team that appears in Space Punisher issue 4, which was released back in 2012. He differs from his 616 counterpart mainly due to his physical appearance, if that wasn't obvious. The character has three talons on each hand, two talons on each foot, and an insect head with antennae and four insect arms. Now, aside from having the same abilities as Henry Pym and this new bug body upgrade, not much else is known about this ant. Man, aside from the fact that he was trying to stop the Kree Skrull War by eliminating both sides with his fellow Avengers members. Moving on to number nine, Anti Vision. Anti Vision from Earth 932 is an evil version of Vision who was a member of the Gatherers, sent to infiltrate the Avengers. He possesses all of the same abilities as Vision, and ultimately meets his end when the Protector cuts him in half for betraying him, something Anti Vision had done in an attempt to save his own butt. But what makes this version of Vision more deadly? Well, he shows more of a range of emotion than the regular 616 Vision does, especially 
especially when it comes to cruelty, with him depicting more delinquent behavior and enjoying causing others pain. Say this much? And at number 8, The Infernal Hulk. This version of the Hulk came from Earth 11638, in which Bruce Banner was the Sorcerer Supreme of that Earth. Banner separated himself from the Hulk, banishing his monstrous half to hell. In doing so, the Hulk became the Infernal Hulk, a stronger, more demonic version of the character, who eventually broke out of hell. Banner had to come up with a plan alongside Spider-Man and Deadpool, and reversed his banishing spell on the Hulk, recombining himself and the Infernal Hulk together, with Banner's neck then being snapped and sacrificed in order to keep the Infernal Hulk from ever taking control of his body and breaking free. Up next, number 7, Ghost Spider. Ghost Spider is the Peter Parker of Earth 11638, an Earth where Uncle Ben never died and actually aided Peter with his superpowers. And Peter created a company called Parker Technologies, which made him super rich. Operating under the mantle of Amazing Spider, he ended up dying. And Bruce Banner, the Sorcerer Supreme from our last number, because this takes place on the same Earth, would strike a deal with him after Banner had gone to hell with his angrier half. Parker was freed, infused with the spirits and powers of the repentant damned, turning him into an amalgamation of Ghost Rider and Spider Man, known as Ghost Spider. His abilities were a combination of both the Web Slingers and Jonathan Blazes from Earth 616. And at number 6, The Dark Avengers. Let's talk about an alternate version of the Avengers, as in the whole team, that appeared on Earth 616 since 2009. The Dark Avengers. The first iteration of the Dark Avengers was assembled by Norman Osborn, who at that point was an anti hero of sorts. The first group included Sentry, Ares, Novar, Mac Gargan's Venom, Moonstone, who portrayed Miss Marvel, Bullseye, who was portraying Hawkeye, and Dakin, Wolverine's son, who operated under his father's mantle. Osborn led the team as Iron Patriot. Hawkeye, as his Ronin persona, then goes public on television declaring Osborn a threat, reminding everyone of his murderous past. In case y'all forgot, which only begins a series of unfortunate events for the team leader, who Later finds himself manipulated by Loki, relapsing into his Green Goblin persona, and declaring war on the Asgardians. Talk about a relapse. A second iteration of the team post the Fear Itself story event was made up of another group of characters who portrayed Avengers members. Tommy Shishido was the Wolverine of the group, Scar, Hulk's son, fit into the role of his father, and Ragnarok took on Thor's role, to name a few. Moving on to number 5, Iron Hammer. Recently, Marvel released a story arc known as Infinity Warps. It was a story in which Gamora had possession of the Infinity Stones and folded the Marvel Universe in half inside of the Soul Gem, which combined different characters' personas into one, leading to a bunch of mashups of Marvel characters. This one is the combination of Thor and Tony Stark's Iron Man, called Stark Odin's son, in which Tony was the son of the chieftain executive of Asgard. Due to his arrogance and vanity, Stark was stripped of his godhood until he learned the pain and loss of being human. Stark would awake on Earth with no memory of his past, but then use his genius level intellect to build up a tech industrial company, creating himself a suit of armor when he was captured and kept prisoner by Dark Elves. See what they did there? They just taking all the things and mashing it together. And at 4, Thor L from Earth 9602. Back in the 90s, DC Comics came together with Marvel to create the Amalgam Universe, a universe in which the characters of DC and Marvel Universes were amalgamated. In it, we were introduced to the combination of Thor and DC's Man of Steel, Superman, creating thor -El. While he didn't get a whole lot of panel time and the character's true extent of his powers were never fully explored, he was considered to be the Kryptonian Thunder God, wielding an energy mallet along with having the combined powers of Thor and Superman. Or rather, the blue energy of Superman. His one weakness is Nora Knight, similar to Kryptonite. Moving on to number 3, Weapon Hex. Weapon Hex is the Infinity Warp version of X-23 Laura Kinney and Wanda Maximoff Scarlet Witch. And just like the other Infinity Warps amalgamations, Weapon Hex has all the same powers as Laura and Wanda combined. Meaning, she's got magical reality warping abilities, meets the claws and healing factors and adamantium skeleton of X-23. Her history is similar to X-23's, having been an experiment that was raised by scientist Sarah Kinney. Except this time, rather than it be a part of the Weapon X program, Sarah was part of an occult scientific sect known as the Evolutionaries. She would later become a member of the Defenders alongside other warped heroes. Speaking of, in at number 2, Soldier Supreme. The last of the Infinity Warps combos on our list. Here we have the amalgamation of Sorcerer Supreme Doctor Stephen Strange and America's most patriotic hero, Steve Rogers. Soldier Supreme's story begins during World War II, with the Super Soldier Serum being a cover for mystical rituals which give Steven Rogers his strength and physicality, all while giving him the magical abilities of strange and access to powerful sorcery. He would go on to fight Dormammu Red, the combination of Dormammu and Red Skull, only to be banished to the Dark Dimension for years. Rogers would live there before finding a way out when a satanic cult opened up a portal to their world. Is that worse than being frozen alive? I, I think it might actually be. Fighting demons all the time. Mm. And finally, in at 1, Zombie Hulk. While Zombie Hulk might not be the first alternate to come to mind when you think of the strongest alternates in the multiverse, he's a character who managed to get himself the power cosmic, 
All thanks to mowing down on the Silver Surfer. So let's backtrack here for a second. Zombie Hulk, aka Bruce Banner of Earth 2149, was infected by the zombie plague after Nick Fury requested his help in trying to resist against it. That clearly did not work out too well, and after he became a zombie, he went around chewing down on a bunch of different characters on Earth 2149. Alongside Wolverine, Iron Man, Power Man, Spider Man, and Giant Man, he ate Silver Surfer and later Galactus, making him into one of the zombie Galacti. This means he has the power to absorb and tap into ambient cosmic energy. While we never see him use the full extent of his abilities, granted thanks to the power cosmic, he does end up smashing Thanos' head in with his bare hands. Something he does because the Mad Titan calls him out for eating more than his share. In at number 10, Marvel 1602's Black Widow. Out of all of her scary alternates on this list, this version of Black Widow is perhaps the most tame. But why is she terrifying? It's because she uses her skills and abilities for some straight up evil stuff. This Natasha is from Earth 311 from Marvel 1602, a world in which she's a freelance spy and is considered the most dangerous woman in all of Europe. From Neil Gaiman and Andy Hubert, the Marvel 1602 series is an alternate reality in which we see our favorite Marvel characters operating during the year 1602 in Europe. The world is very much like it is on Earth 616 in that time period as well. Now, Natasha had previously worked alongside Matthew Murdock, but then betrayed him for Count Otto Von Doom. Otto Octavius and Victor Von Doom smoked together. She ended up becoming the villain's lover. She worked with him during the kidnapping of William Shakespeare, serving as the captain of his flying ship, up until she started questioning his authority and his plans, which resulted in him pushing her over the side of the ship to her death. What a way to go. Up next, number nine, Age of X Steve Rogers from Earth 11326. Here we have a version of Steve Rogers who's all for the killing and hunting of mutants, or at least he was in the beginning. As the leader of the Avengers, it was his job to hunt mutants down. During one mission in particular, he ends up giving into his bloodlust and kills Mystique, justifying her death as the right thing to do because she was dangerous. That's when he discovers that she was actually protecting a group of mutant children. Steel Corpse, who is the alternate of Tony Stark on that Earth, suffers from an emergency override with his armor and attempts to kill the children anyway, triggering the man inside the suit to inform Rogers to not save him but to save the kids instead. Steve ends up shooting him in the back of his head. This Steve is then killed while battling the Hulk, with Legacy then absorbing his memories as a way of saying thank you for changing his ways and attempting to help mutants in the end. He turns out for the better, but I guess, you know, bloodlust is still pretty scary, right? Moving on to number 8, Hawkeye of Earth 11223. This version of Hawkeye is a product of the What If Dark Reign type Title from issue 1, volume 1. In this story, set on Earth 11223, Clint is a member of the Avengers, as per usual. The team goes after the X Men, believing they are involved in the deaths of Tony Stark and Beast. That's when Hawkeye pretty much gets his butt handed to him by Sabretooth. Ultimately, his life is spared by the mutants, but it only gets more tragic for the sharpshooter from there on out. He heads back to the Avengers mansion, only to witness it getting completely destroyed, with all of the remaining Avengers being killed in the process. So Hawkeye takes matters into his own hands and seeks out the culprit, Norman Osborn, believing that he doesn't deserve to live, and that killing him is the only way to end his reign of terror. Dark Hawkeye. And at number 7, Venom Thor from Earth 1089. This alternative Thor comes from What If Volume 2, Issue 4, in a story called what if the alien costume had possessed Spider-Man? The alien costume it's referring to is Venom prior to the character coming into his full-fledged Eddie Brock hosted glory. In this hypothetical tale, Peter Parker doesn't seek out the help of Reed Richards like he does on the 616 Earth. Instead, the Venom symbiote stays bonded to Parker until he begins to sniff out some stronger potential hosts, having used up all of Parker's adrenaline in the process. Now, Initially, the Venom symbiote jumps to the Hulk, but when he sets eyes on Thor, he ditches Hulk and heads over to the Asgardian God. Thor's tenor as Venom is brief, with Reed Richards employing the help of Black Bolt to use his sonic scream to separate Thor from Venom before the two are permanently bonded. But in the process, Black Bolt does destroy Mount Rushmore. <laughs> but hey, at least Thor ends up getting free of the symbiote. That's at least good, right? I mean, it's only Mount Rushmore. In at number 6, the ultimate free Black Widow. This version of Black Widow is notably worse than the one we mentioned previously. I mean, she is, you know, higher up on the list, so kind of a given. The Ultimate 1610 universe in general gives us a grim take on beloved Marvel characters, exploring different aspects of their character personality traits that were never ventured into in the 616 universe. This Black Widow is a prime example of that. Her origin story is similar to her 616 beginnings, but the reason she's called Black Widow is thanks to a reputation she's cultivated by killing her husbands, marrying frequently, and then assassinating them. Or rather, they would end up suffering from unfortunate accidents. She eventually defected from the KGB to the US and joined SHIELD. She would later marry Tony Stark, 
who gave her an all black suit of Iron Man armor and a set of nanites that bonded to her skin in order to control the suit, all as an engagement present. But now here's where it gets awkward for Tony. Turns out Natasha is a traitor and reveals the identity of the Hulk, frames Captain America and Thor, and then aids the liberators with their invasion of the US, all as a way to seek revenge for Russia, believing that the US made her country into a bankrupt nation of hookers and gangsters. She then kills Jarvis, holds Tony hostage in an attempt to extort him of his fortune, but then then, Tony uses the nanites in her body to freeze her in place, knocks her unconscious with a wine bottle, giving her brain damage. And then, when she's hospitalized, Hawkeye comes after her, shooting her in the head with one of his arrows, all because she was partially responsible for his family's death. Talk about dark. Up next at 5, Herald of Galactus Thor from Earth 717. Here we have another what if story concerning Thor from Volume 1 of What If Thor Issue 1. This Thor appears in a story called What If Thor Was the Herald of Galactus. It's a bleak tale in which Thor, upon Galactus' arrival at Asgard, realizes that fighting against the devourer of worlds is futile and ends up striking a deal with the cosmic entity instead. Leave Asgard alone and he would become Galactus' herald. He goes around informing the inhabitants of various planets that Galactus has chosen in their worlds to satiate his appetite, and that their homes could not be spared. Destruction was inevitable. Eventually though, Thor ends up returning to his home on Asgard briefly, only to discover that his father Odin has been killed by Loki, and the trickster god has imprisoned all of his pals. So Thor rescues those remaining alive, sends them to Earth, and then brings Galactus to Asgard to consume it. Up next at 4, Vampire Captain America from 3931. Cap has a history of transforming into supernatural beings. Cap Wolf, anybody? This time around though, this Steve Rogers from Earth 3931 is a different horror movie being. He's a vampire. On this Earth, Steve was infected with vampirism during World War II by Baron Blood, who on this Earth is actually a vampire badass humanoid creature. After being bitten, Rogers develops new powers and ends up infecting the rest of the Avengers team, making them his personal slaves. The exiles would encounter him when trying to fix his world, and eventually Rogers was decapitated. But that was not the end of him. He ends up surviving and reattaches his head to his body. From Vampires to Zombies, in at our next number, we have Marvel Zombies Hawkeye from Earth 2149. We feature the zombie versions of the Avengers on our last list, but this time we're going to get a bit more specific and look at one Avengers member in particular who has quite the compelling and eerie arc Clint Barton of Earth 2149. Hawkeye's past is presumably the same as the 616 Hawkeye up until the zombie plague. When the Avengers attempted to stop the sentry who had been infected, he bites all of them, overpowering them and infecting them. During the siege on Castle Doomstadt in Latveria, zombie Hawkeye is decapitated by Magneto. He uses Steve Rogers' shield to do so. Flash forward to 40 years later, T'Challa's grandson finds a very confused and incoherent head in the rubble of New York. Hawkeye is still alive but has gone insane thanks to, well, just being ahead. He's taken back to T'Challa, who realizes that Hawkeye's hunger has dissipated and ends up giving him the wasp's glass domed suit to use as a body. He's later killed by the Hulk, who smashes his head in, crushing it, killing him once and for all. In at number two, Skeletal Peter Parker from Earth 9811. Shout out to Smasher for the suggestion for this number. So, this version of Spider Man comes from What If Volume 2, issue 114 from 1998, issue 114 from 1998, in a story called Brave New World. It's a different take on Secret Wars, with the participants of that story event being trapped on Battle World, never returning to Earth. And it's 25 years after the Secret Wars event, the first one that is. They're forced to settle down, with many of the heroes and villains getting married and having kids. Now, in the midst of all this, we see Spider Man still wearing the black symbiote costume, aka Venom, something that he had had removed by Reed Richards after Secret Wars. But here's the kicker because he never got the chance to get it removed, it permanently bonded to him, with the symbiote eventually consuming Peter's body entirely. Entirely, leaving only a skeleton. At one point in the story, we see the symbiote jump off of Peter's skeleton when affected by a sonic attack, revealing that Parker has been dead for a very, very long time, and Venom has been running the show. Peter's mind hasn't totally been possessed by the symbiote, though, which perhaps makes this even creepier. And finally, in at number one, Dark Beast from Earth 295. While Beast is largely considered to be a member of the X Men, it's not the only team in the comics that he was ever a part of. Once upon a time, he was a member of the Avengers, too. He's also been a member of the Secret Avengers and the Defenders. He gets around a lot when it comes to superhero teams fighting for justice. But you know who doesn't? His dark counterpart, who hails from Earth 295, the Age of Apocalypse timeline, in which Charles Xavier was killed off, leading to Magneto leading the resistance, and Apocalypse attacking sooner. Apocalypse manages to conquer North America because of it. 
So how does Xavier's absence turn Beast into a villain? Well, without Charles around, Beast's intelligence and desire for experimentation were unhindered by morals and ethics. He wasn't compassionate like his 616 counterpart. So he ends up becoming one of Apocalypse's chief scientists, who tortures and experiments on both humans and mutants unethically. Including Cyclops and Jean Grey, which is how he ends up getting the nickname Beast, since he's so damn cruel and gruesome. He ends up escaping from that reality before it's blown to smithereens, coming to Earth 616. He then pretends to be 616 Hank McCoy, killing off the childhood friends of that beast in order to cover his tracks, and eventually joins up with Onslaught. In at number 10, Peter's music. Starting off this list, we've got a theory about Peter and his music, and why he's so attached to it. Now, the obvious reason is because it's a connection to his mother. She gave half rift off that sentiment, and think his attachment is also due to his connection to Earth, theorizing that Peter hasn't been back to Earth in almost 23 years. Meaning that his mixtape is the only English that he's heard over the course of the time that he's been away. While the films are in English, that doesn't mean the primary language is spoken in English. Food for thought. In at number nine, Slither and Guardians. On a sillier note, another theory kicking around in the interwebs has connected Guardians of the Galaxy to one of director James Gunn's earlier films, Slither. Slither is a 2006 black comedy horror and was Gunn's directorial debut, and it plays with some pretty goofy horror tropes. Disgusting. Don't let him in your mouth! No! It will change the face. The horror. Marriage is a sacred bond, for better or worse. Much worse. In one scene, there's a slug that is on a planet that isn't Earth, and it attacks a rat like creature. In Guardians of the Galaxy 1, the space slugs that are in Slither make an appearance in the scene at the Collectors. Fans have speculated that the rat creature in Slither is the Orlani, which is a race of rat like creatures that appear in both Guardian films. You know the ones that Groot ends up punching in the beginning of the second film? Which hypothetically makes those slugs the same species as the ones in Slither that ended up on Earth. In our number 8 spot, Mantis is Ego's daughter. When we meet Mantis, she tells the Guardians that Ego had found her on her home planet where she was in her larvae state. This has led people to wonder why Ego was on her home planet in the first place, and if he was there on his quest to hunt down his offspring. While he kills those who don't exhibit celestial powers, he may have seen Mantis's powers as useful in other ways, and chose to keep her alive. If I touch someone, I can feel their feelings. And at number 7, Avengers playing D&D. A fun theory from Tumblr account Blue and Orange, this one speculates that the Guardians of the Galaxy are actually the Avengers playing Dungeons and Dragons, and all of the characters are a result of that. And despite the characters now being well acquainted in the MCU, this theory still makes for a good laugh. And some of the arguments are actually pretty great. Tony Stark is supposed to be playing a Star-Lord, they're both sarcastic and womanizers. Black Widow is Gamora, a master assassin raised from childhood. Hawkeye is Yondu, cause arrows, and Thor is Drax, who is also ignorant of Earth's social norms. While obviously this theory doesn't pan out at all, we would like to think that maybe later on down the road the Avengers may bust out a game of D&D &D and use their new pals as characters. Wishful thinking much? In at number 6, Rocket was created by Thanos. James Gunn has noted that we'll be getting to know a lot more about Rocket Raccoon's backstory in the upcoming film, saying, I quote, It's going to be a little different from the comics. It's a little bit more horrible. Ooh. Now, during volume 2, we got a moment with Nebula in which she got into the details of what Thanos used to do to her whenever she failed to beat Gamora in combat. Fans may recall that Rocket had a similarly gruesome description of his own origins in volume 1, which has led to the speculation that perhaps Thanos was behind Rocket's creation. I didn't have to be torn apart and put back together over and over and turn into some some little monster. Rocket, no one's calling you a monster. All that being said, by the time that we see the Guardians' next solo film, Thanos may be long gone, depending on what goes down in the upcoming fourth Avengers movie. Up next, number five, Adam Warlock. High Priestess Aisha, the leader of the Sovereign, initially hired the Guardians. But now, she and her people are their enemies. During the post credit scene in Guardians Volume 2, Aisha is seen discussing a new creation of hers that she plans on using against the Guardians, and says, I think I shall call him Adam. Adam. It's then revealed she's looking at a cocoon structure similar to Adam Warlock's in the comics. James Gunn has yet to confirm that Warlock will appear in the film, saying, I quote, Who knows how long it will take for him to bake in that cocoon? Fans are speculating that he'll initially be the villain in the third film, although he may turn to the side of good fairly quickly. That being said, some are still hopeful that he'll somehow play into the Infinity War storyline, considering that Adam Warlock was a massive part of the Infinity Gauntlet miniseries that the third Avengers film was primarily based off of. Regardless, it seems likely that he will play a part in the Guardian story in some way or form. 
And at number four, Groot is part of the Yggdrasil tree. The Yggdrasil tree is mentioned in various occasions throughout the MCU. In Captain America the First Avenger, Red Skull discusses it in his first scene of the film, while looking at a carving of it on a wall, calling it the Guardian of Wisdom and Fate. It's mentioned in the Thor films as the tree that connects the nine realms. We know that Groot, when destroyed, can generate into another living Groot, which is what spawned the theory. It would also explain why Groot's criminal record at the Nova Corps reads Origin X, although the latter seems to be a bit of a long shot. Up next, number three, Peter's power is in nowhere. Some fans have taken it upon themselves to try to decipher the space coordinates that appear throughout the Guardians films by swapping out the numbers and the coordinates to letters. Nowhere, which is where the Guardians are headed to in their next film, had coordinates that translated to Meredith Quill X, which some people assumed means that there is another part of Ego, who was her ex, located on Nowhere. Nowhere is already known to possess a severed celestial head. Could there be a connection? In our number two spot, Peter didn't lose his powers. In Guardians Volume 2, when Ego is destroyed, Peter is supposed to lose his powers, since his celestial abilities are directly tied to his father. One theory from a Reddit user named Cory Oreo claims that Peter didn't actually lose his powers in the battle against Ego, but that he still retained them, and that Ego was lying to him about losing them. This comes from the logic that if both of their powers draw from the same finite source, a second outlet doesn't double it. It just splits it in half of what each of them get. Meaning if Peter was pulling his powers from the power at the center of Ego's planet, Ego wouldn't be able to access his full extent of powers. Because someone else is grabbing that energy. Interesting, but perhaps not entirely plausible. And last but not least, in our number one spot, all the Guardians die. Bleak, yeah? James Gunn has stated in multiple interviews that the team of Guardians in Volume 3 will be the last time that we see the current Guardians team. This could mean that the group could diversify. It could lose a member. Or, as some are suggesting, it could mean the Guardians will all die at the end of Volume 3. It seems a bit excessive, but if Adam Warlock is the villain they go up against, there's a fairly good chance that defeat is in their cards. Or maybe that's not the reason at all. All that being said, there's a lot to consider when we look at the events of Avengers Infinity War. While most are assuming that Thanos' snap that eliminated half of all living things will be reversed, many are speculating that Gamora's death won't be reversible, since Thanos had sacrificed her prior to, in order to obtain the Soul Stone. Currently, only Rocket and Nebula are left remaining after Infinity War, which also suggests that if certain members can't be brought back to life, Rocket may be the one leading the Guardians for Volume 3. He was the leader of the group in the comics for a duration of time. But that doesn't really line up with what James Gunn had said about that being the last time that we see all of the Guardians together. Will they really put us through that emotional turmoil of having all the characters return in the fourth Avengers film only to kill them all off again? It seems a little unlikely. Maybe they just part ways, I don't know. And at number 10, Gamora is really dead. In Infinity War, we got to learn a lot more about the history between Thanos and his adoptive daughter Gamora. In order to obtain the Soul Stone on Vormir, Thanos had to sacrifice something that he truly loved. While Gamora laughed at the fact that she believed Thanos could never love anyone, I guess joke's on her, cause Thanos got emotional, and then sacrificed her in order to get the stone. Ouch. She wasn't the only casualty either. Many other characters lost their lives in the film, most of which bit the dust thanks to Thanos' snap that eliminated half of all living things. Spoilers! This theory speculates that unlike those who were dusted, Gamora won't be coming back to life since her death occurred before the snap. Now that being said, Thanos spoke to a younger version of her when he seemingly entered the Soul Stone after the snap. Soul World! So there is hope that she isn't gone for good. But many believe that Gamora, along with Heimdall, Vision, and perhaps Loki, if he didn't pull off a slight trick, won't be making a return. Feel like Loki will though. Moving on to number 9, Drax's End. When we first met Drax, his one goal in life was to kill Ronan the Accuser for murdering his family. Good goal! His goal then changed after Ronan's defeat, migrating to Thanos, who was more so responsible for the galactic genocides taking place beyond races other than just Drax's. While some believe that Drax will somehow be involved in the final battle against Thanos, many believe that he just might end up dead in the process. In that much more grim theory, people have speculated that Drax might get killed off altogether in that final battle. Rumor has it that Dave Bautista is considering a full time return to the WWE, which is where he started his career as a wrestler long before becoming an actor, if you don't consider that as actually acting. While the rumors have yet to be confirmed or denied, it's still a possibility, and would provide an easy way for the character to bow out, especially considering Batista's outspoken disapproval of director James Gunn's firing. Moving on to number 8, Groot doesn't dance for Drax. This one might actually add up pretty well. So, on multiple occasions, you may have noticed when baby Groot dances, he stops dancing whenever Drax looks at him. Why would he need to hide his adorable little jig from the character? Well, according to Redditor Lieutenant Commander Carter, perhaps the reason why baby Groot freezes on the spot is because he thinks dancing upsets Drax. The theory suggests that Groot doesn't want to dance in front of him because he loves and respects him. In Volume 2, Drax comments that his murdered wife never danced, and that it was a good thing. So Groot never lets Drax see him dance because he doesn't want to seem frivolous or disrespectful to Drax's ways. That's definitely one way to take a deeper look into that adorable post credit scene from the first Guardians film, isn't it? Dance and Groot. Moving on to number 7, Earth's Music. Another theory found on Reddit, this one crafted up by user Kodoro dives 
further into why music is such a key part of the Guardians movies. So, for starters, it's undeniable that both of the Guardians of the Galaxy films, Volume 1 and 2, have phenomenal soundtracks. Second, we know how much music means to Peter Quill since his mixtape was the last gift from his mother, and really his only connection to her while out in the galaxy. But that music also resonates with many other individuals in the galaxy who come across it throughout the movies. All the other Guardians like the music. Groot dances to the tracks multiple times. The prison guard in the first film takes Peter's Walkman and tries to steal it all together, and so on. So what's the big deal, other than his tunes are really good? Well, this theory speculates that Earth's taste in music is actually incredibly advanced compared to other races out there, with many others having more of a primitive rhythm to their music compared to the kinds of artists that Peter has on his mixtapes. And at number 6, Nova's introduction. James Gunn had leaked a little while back that Marvel Studios were considering introducing superhero Nova into the fray, but that he wasn't planning on introducing the character into the Guardians movies. Now we've already seen the Nova Corps in the Guardians films, but don't be mistaken, Gunn was discussing the character Nova, who is a member of the Corps as an intergalactic police officer. Nova was first introduced in the comics in 1976, created by Marv Wolfman and John Romita Sr. years before, but officially became Nova in a comic called The Man Called Nova. He was intended to be an homage to Stan Lee and Steve Ditko's Spider-Man, but in space. There are a few theories concerning how Nova will be integrated, or whether now that Gunn is out, if he'll even be considered as part of the MCU. But perhaps the most interesting theory is that Thanos' actions in Infinity War are the catalyst to Nova's MCU introduction. The theory suggests that the Nova Corps and Xandar were likely wiped out by Thanos, considering he got his hands on the Power Stone that they had put under their care at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1. Now consider the plotline of a man called Nova. Xandar is destroyed by a villain who claims to be Thanos' child, and one Nova soldier manages to escape to Earth. That soldier is Roman Day, who already exists in the MCU and is played by John C. Riley. Roman finds a high school student who ends up becoming his predecessor, a kid named Richard Ryder, who then becomes Nova. So it would make sense for the story to be adapted into the MCU, since its setup wouldn't be too difficult. The question is, now that James Gunn is out of the picture, would Marvel Studios prefer to follow the Nova Corps storyline in the Guardians movies and reveal this new hero there, perhaps setting up his character as one of the future Guardians of the Galaxies that will be replacing the current iteration? So many questions. But I mean, totally plausible. Now before we continue our list, we're just going to take a quick pause in between between numbers to tell you a little bit more about our awesome sponsor for this video, Wix. Getting your own website is so very important in this technology driven world that we live in. Regardless of what industry you work in, Wix gives you an infinite amount of possibilities to craft exactly the kind of website you want, limited only by your own imagination. They do all of the heavy lifting with reliable hosting to keep your site safe and secure, offering custom domains and mailboxes, email marketing, and so much more. It doesn't matter if you're brand new to web building, a novice, a business owner, or a professional website builder. The technology that Wix boasts makes achieving your digital creation a smooth ride, with templates you can choose from, or a blank slate for you to craft your site from scratch. And there's a ton of features that you can use to boost your content, from pro galleries to video hosting to bookings. Perfect for e-commerce, artists, hotels, events, restaurants, you name it. And we've also whipped up our own little website on Wix for you guys to check out. It's a fan theory website where you guys can submit your own fan theories or fan theories that you love. Now be sure to check it out, the link is in the video description below, and is right underneath me too for that matter. Alright, back to the theories now. Moving on to number 5, Rocket and NASA. Now there's been a lot of speculation as to Rocket's origin story. Now in our last list, part 1, we broke down a theory that suggested Thanos was responsible for making Rocket, considering he and Nebula have kind of similar stories when it comes to bio modifications and robotics. Now we know Rocket was cybernetically engineered, hence why he's so highly intelligent. We also know he was tortured while being transported.
Living Tribunal in the upcoming fourth Avengers movie. So it would not be a shocker if the Celestials will become much more present in the MCU overall. And Eternity could easily make an appearance in the Guardians films if and when Adam Warlock decides to pop up. To have a wee bit of a history. Moving on to number 3, Mantis's Purpose. After Mantis's introduction in Guardians Volume 2, there was quite the stir online about the character, including a theory that speculated that she was Peter's half-sister, and that Ego had fathered her with a mother of her species. Now in the film we do see evidence that Ego had hooked up with someone of Mantis's species, which James Gunn later confirmed on Instagram, although he would later note that the sibling theory was not true. We also know that Mantis will continue to play a role in the Guardians movies moving forward, since she's confirmed to be in Volume 3. But ever since Avengers Infinity War came out, a new theory has emerged about Mantis, one that speculates that she will be the Celestial Madonna. Now upon discovering Thor in Infinity War, the Guardians, minus Quill, are all captivated by his handsomeness and muscular figure. Mantis speaks up and says, it's like his muscles are made of Kotati metal fibers. Now in the comics, the Kotati are a race of telepathic humanoid tree creatures who live on a planet with the Kree. They also have a prophecy concerning a celestial Madonna, something that in the comics, the Kree believe Mantis will become, eventually mating with the eldest Kotati on Earth and eventually becoming the most important being in the universe. Yeah, that's a big job. Perhaps Mantis will become invaluable in Volume 3, perhaps facing off against Adam Warlock if the theory about him first appearing as a Guardian's villain comes true. Either way, it would be really cool to see Mantis step up and do something really awesome, aside from, you know, making Peter Quill feel uncomfortable about his feelings. And at number 2, Thor joins the the team. After the events of Infinity War and pretty much the loss of almost every Asgardian left alive, many a fan has wondered if Thor, after the fourth Avengers movie, will retire from being an Avenger, and perhaps become a Guardian instead. Now we know that the third Guardians film will be the last iteration of the current Guardians team, but we don't know whether that means if some of its current members will still stay on the team. Fans have speculated because of the bond that Rocket, Groot, and Thor established in Infinity War, Thor may be inclined to join up with them and adventure around the galaxy if Cap dies, if Tony retires, and if Hulk does does, well, something that hopefully involves better CGI than Mark Ruffalo in the Hulkbuster suit. Just saying. In a theory posted by Redditor Kali Zero, the theory suggests that since Thor has lost his people, his culture, and likely the other Avengers, if he survives the upcoming Avengers movie, he's gonna be pretty aimless. Except that we've seen how awesome Thor's Avengers are in space thanks to Thor Ragnarok. And Chris Hemsworth was also a big fan of how great Ragnarok turned out. So Thor could very well end up joining with Nova, Rocket, and Groot and be a part of the next version of the team. Who knows? I mean, hey, it'd be a really interesting team if that happened. And finally, in at number one, the timeline. Due to the deaths that occurred in Infinity War, specifically Gamora's, some fans have speculated that Volume 3 will take place prior to the events of Infinity War. Back when James Gunn was set to direct the third installment of the series, he had revealed that Volume 3 would be the last time that we saw the current iteration of the Guardians altogether. The Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 occurred four years before the events of Infinity War, and the upcoming Captain Marvel film is set to take place in the 90s, so we know that the MCU isn't a stranger to time jumps, or having their film timelines occur in a non-linear fashion. It could make perfect sense, and it could be emotionally much more impactful if we get to see Gamora one last time knowing that she's now deceased. Talk about painful. Plus, if Adam Warlock is introduced, and there is a whole adventure in the soul world, perhaps, maybe we'll end up seeing him and Gamora get together, which is what happens in the comics, so maybe it won't be the end of Gamora after all, but it might be the end of her tenure on the Guardians team. And at number 10, Ultimate's Hank Pym. Hank Pym of Earth-616 has had his fair share of scary moments, but nothing compares to his Earth-1610 Ultimate's counterpart who is straight up villainous. While Pym's history of bad mental health related experiences are arguably no faults of his own in the main Marvel continuity, the actions of Ultimate Pym are rooted in jealousy and some serious anger. Anger issues. Pym was a mentally fragile scientist who was utterly brilliant, and gained his abilities after he experimented on the blood of his wife Janet, who was a mutant. The couple, already struggling in their marriage, join the Ultimates, and Janet befriends Captain America, who Hank gets irrationally jealous of. The two have a major physical fight with Hank pushing Janet around, and then she shrinks down to her wasp size. He then gets bug spray and uses it on her, leading her to be hospitalized. Cap would then beat the crap out of Hank for it kicking him off the team. Later during the Ultimatum storyline, Hank teams up with Hawkeye to find his estranged wife after Magneto flooded the eastern seaboard, and Janet went missing. When they do find her, Blob is eating her corpse. Hank loses it, grows in size, and then rips off the Blob's head with his teeth. Enough said. And at number 9, what if World War Hulk? The Hulk, thanks to his gamma radiation and his ability to grow in power the angrier he gets, is an Avengers member who often finds himself in darker alternate stories than his teammates. What if World War Hulk is the first of a handful of these on their list? Back 
Back in 2010, a what if story took the World War Hulk storyline from 2007 and adapted it into a hypothetical scenario. For context, World War Hulk was the story event that followed Planet Hulk, which followed the Hulk's narrative after he was banished from Earth by the Illuminati, spending time on Sakaar. World War Hulk follows him returning to Earth with the intent of getting revenge. This what if comic leads to a much darker ending than its namesake event, with Iron Man attempting to take Hulk out with a satellite weapon, except this time it ends up killing Sentry, Mr. Fantastic, and Iron Man himself. When Secret Invasion rolls around without these three heroes still alive, Earth ends up pretty screwed, with 80% of the population getting killed off. Hulk attempts to lead the Avengers, but a Skrull pretending to be the Wasp sets off a genetic time bomb during an Avengers meeting. It kills all of them except for Hulk. Hulk goes to extreme measures, asking Galactus to put a stop to the madness altogether by consuming the Earth and all the Skrulls within it. Hulk ends up becoming his new herald, known as the World Breaker. In at number 8, Hulk the End. Speaking of the Hulk, let's take a look at another alternate version of the Big Green Monster, one that is just as depressing. The End was a series of comics from Marvel that explored a possible future timeline for several of their characters, including the Hulk. Not all of them are depressing as this one, to give them credit. Anywho, this one shot comic features Bruce Banner and the Hulk as the only survivors of a nuclear holocaust. Banner, unable to die, walks the earth alone in sorrow, whereas the Hulk is angry that he's forced to be alive with only Banner left on the planet with him. Banner's psyche slowly fades away as the Hulk wanders around, getting attacked by mutant cockroaches, slowly regenerating, and so on and so forth. A camera from an alien species, known only as the recorder in the comic, watches him from afar. Far, confirming that humankind has been eliminated. Banner watches some of the horrific things that the camera has caught the Hulk enduring and regenerating from. Eventually, Banner dies, and the Hulk finally gets to be alone at last, only to realize that he is in fact alone forever. See what I mean about depressing? And at number 7, Marvel Zombies. We're talking about all of the Avengers in at this number. Marvel Zombies came out in 2005, and depicted pretty much the entirety of the Marvel Universe on Earth being either brutally murdered, consumed, or transforming into a zombie. It was intense. And of course, one half of the creative team behind it was Robert Kirkman. Anywho, after the zombified heroes and villains managed to eat their way through the rest of the living on Earth, some of them managed to gain some cosmic powers thanks to the individuals they've consumed, and begin looking for more meals off planet. It's a little horrifying. And at 6, Iron Maniac. Iron Maniac is an evil version of Iron Man who hails from Earth 5012, first appearing in issue 2, volume 3 of Marvel Team Up. What's his deal? Well, on his Earth, the Avengers are mostly wiped out by an alien the name of Titanus. Reed Richards loses his crap, and thanks to an attack from the Human Torch, Iron Man is majorly scarred, causing him to adopt a suit of armor similar to Doctor Doom's. Iron Man decides to make it his mission to stop Reed Richards, who then banishes him to Earth 616. While there, Iron Maniac takes on the Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom, who all think he's a Doom imposter. When the war against Titanus doesn't break out and ruin 616 like it did in his world, Iron Maniac still goes after this Earth's heroes, deeming himself still as the sole survivor of a sane world living in a backwards, insane world. And at number 5, Ruins Hulk. Ruins is by far one of the most depressing and dark alternate reality stories in the Marvel multiverse. Written in 1995 by Warren Ellis, it's set in a dystopian version of the Marvel Universe, and is a parody of the Marvel series, except notably more twisted. A reporter named Phil Sheldon explores the universe and sees how all of these superpowered individuals now suffer from a myriad of deformities and painful deaths. We learn that Captain America was into cannibalism, that the destruction of the last Avengers Quinjet is what killed Cap, Iron Man, Giant Man, and Wasp, and that the Hulk, thanks to his exposure to gamma radiation, has turned into this, a giant monstrous green mass of pulsating tumors. It ain't pretty. This happened when Banner saved his pal Rick Jones from getting hit with the experimental gamma bomb, and instead of, you know, becoming the full-fledged Hulk, he became this. No bueno. And at number four, Fascist Vision. In this 1990s What If, oh, in the 1990s comic What If the Vision of the Avengers Conquer the World, issue 19 of the What If series, we see what the android would become if he were, well, a fascist. The story begins with Vision deciding that in order to achieve global order and any semblance of peace, he needs to implant himself within every single computer across the globe. As you can imagine, this doesn't go over well with humans. In the aftermath, New York City is nuked and Vision ends up becoming a supreme ruler of sorts over the planet, continuously being corrupted by all of his newfound power. He ends up taking his ambitions off planet too, seeking to control the Kree Empire, the Skrulls, and even the Badoon Empire. And at number 3, Hydra Cap. One of the more recent comic book controversies was found in the pages of Marvel's Captain America Steve Rogers comic, which led into the Secret Empire storyline of 2017. Long story short, it was revealed that Captain America had all along been a sleeper Hydra agent, helping lay the foundation for a global Hydra takeover. Cap literally said the words, Hail Hydra, and comic book fans everywhere, along with like a chunk of the internet, 
freaked out. Cap being a secret Nazi went against everything that the character stood for, everything the character's historical context blossomed from. That's when Marvel pulled a Death of Superman esque stunt and was like, hey guys, guess what? It isn't really the real Captain America who is a Nazi, it's one from an alternate reality. Here we have Steven Rogers of Earth 61311, the Captain America who was developed as a child to be a supporter of Hydra thanks to the living embodiment of the Cosmic Cube and Red Skull's influence. And at number two, Hulk Future Imperfect. This version of the Hulk, also known as Maestro, comes from Earth 9200 and first appeared back in 1992. This Earth takes place around 100 years into the future where a nuclear war has taken out most of the superpowered individuals and the human race faces extinction. Maestro, affected by the radiation, mixed with holding a grudge against humanity for how he's been treated, ends up taking over the planet as its ruler. His strength is multiplied thanks to the new radiation he's absorbed and he still maintains Banner's intelligence. The present day Hulk from Earth 616 believes that the Maestro's insanity has also contributed to his increase in power. 616 Hulk has fought against him before and has been privy to many future versions of himself, even realizing when aspects of Maestro become apparent in his life, like when he enjoyed taking out his rivals and when he contemplated growing a beard. Yes. Actually. And finally, in at number one, Old Man Logan's Hulk. There are a lot of devastating interpretations of characters on Old Man Logan's Earth, Earth 807128. After the supervillains took over, Hulk, whom some believed had slowly started to go insane thanks to absorbing additional radiation from an atomic bomb that was dropped on California, joined in on the evil shenanigans. He took over California, renamed it Hulk Land, and then shagged up with his first cousin, She Hulk, in order to create a whole inbred family of little Hulks, which was then called the Hulk Gang. Wolverine Hulk a debt and came up short with his rent, so Banner sent his children to press Logan, who struck up a deal with them to be a bodyguard for Clint Barton. While Logan was away, Banner ordered that his family be killed regardless. Logan then sought out revenge, killing Banner's family one by one, and eventually went after Banner himself. Banner tells Logan that he was hoping he'd go wild, wanting a good fight like the old days, and wanted his Wolverine back. The two fight, and Bruce transforms into the Hulk and eats Logan whole, who then claws his way out of the Hulk's stomach. Killing. Starting us off in at number 10, War Machine. War Machine, aka James Rhodes, was one of the initial members of the Secret Avengers, but eventually was assigned as the government's own Iron Man due to a contract between Tony Stark's Stark Resilient Company and the Pentagon. He served as a lieutenant at the time. But let's jump back for a sec. James Rhodes first appeared in Iron Man issue 118 in 1979, but wouldn't suit up until a handful of years later in 1983 in Iron Man issue 170 when he donned the Iron Man mantle. He would eventually become War Machine in 1992 in Iron Man issue 280. After it was revealed that Tony Stark wasn't dead after all, and that he wanted Rhodey to have the variable threat response battle suit, since it always kind of belonged to his pal anyway. His war machine suit gives him the abilities similar to Stark's in his Iron Man suit, including superhuman strength, durability, supersonic flight, and the use of an energy repulsor and a variety of offensive and defensive weaponry at his disposal. Rhodes would rejoin the team as part of one of the Marvel Now recruits, but as Iron Patriot, leaving the team once again in Secret Adventures Volume 1, Issue 16. Moving on to number 9, the human. Human Torch. We're, talk we're talking Jim Hammond here. The Human Torch, the android version of the character, is one of a handful of characters on this list that aren't one of the original Secret Avengers team members from the 2010 iteration. Hammond would become known as one of the Shattered Heroes recruits, who joined the team during Secret Avengers issue 22 and 2012. But Hammond's history goes way further back than that. A Golden Age hero, he was one of Timely Comics' signature characters, Timely being Marvel's predecessor. While the Johnny Storm version of the Human Torch would adapt Hammond's abilities, their origins could be any more different. Hammond is an android created by Professor Phineas T. Horton. At his grand unveiling, the android burst into flames when exposed to oxygen and was perceived to be a threat to the public. He was sealed in concrete as a safety measure, but the sentient robot broke free thanks to a crack that let oxygen seep through. He can manipulate fire, is resistant to it, can fly, and can survive without oxygen for long periods of time. Hammond would eventually depart from the team during Secret Avengers issue 37. Moving on to number 8, Moon Knight. Mark Spector was one of the original nine teammates that made up the first iteration of the Secret Avengers. He's also one of their most intriguing members, being an expert detective often compared to Batman from DC Comics. Mark Spector was initially a boxer and US Marine, and is an expert in a variety of different forms of hand-to-hand -hand combat including Judo, Kung Fu, and Muay Thai. He gained his superhuman powers from the Egyptian moon god Khonshu, giving him superhuman strength, endurance, and reflexes all based on the phases of the moon. But those powers 
powers would be removed from the character in 2007 during his solo Midnight Sun arc, with Spectre admitting that he lost them due to disobedience. Spectre also has multiple personalities and is notoriously psychologically unstable. Spectre would leave the Secret Avengers in issue 21. Up next, looking at the team leader himself, in at 7, Captain Steve Rogers. Steve Rogers is yet another one of Timely's staple trifecta, having been created in 1941 by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Designed as a wartime patriotic super soldier, often fighting against the Axis powers of World War II, the character would fall into obscurity in 1950, showing up a few times and then later being revived in 1964, where he was thought out of ice and became one of the Avengers. He has been on many a team in the past, most famously, obviously the Avengers, but has dabbled in other iterations, including the Secret Avengers. His strength comes from the super soldier serum, giving him peak human strength, speed, durability, agility, reflexes, senses, and an accelerated healing factor. In addition to that, he is a master tactician, strategist, and field commander, and definitely knows his way around hand to hand combat. Steve would leave the team in Secret Avengers issue 22, but eventually return to his position as the leader of the Avengers, resuming his role as Captain America. And fun fact the costume that Cap wears in the MCU film Captain America the Winter Soldier was inspired by the super soldier costume that he wore. War in the first volume of Secret Avengers. Moving on to six, Captain Britain. Here we have a member from the Shattered Heroes recruits. Captain Britain, aka Brian Braddock, found himself joining up in issue 22 of the first volume of Secret Avengers. Captain Britain first appeared in 1976's Captain Britain issue 1, a comic exclusively published in the UK by Marvel. He has superhuman strength, speed, endurance, agility, durability, reflexes, and senses. He can create force fields, energy beams, and he can even fly. His powers were initially thanks to a mystical amulet called the Amulet of Right, which brought would rub to transform into a superhero persona, but that would later change with his powers being tied to his emotions instead. Up next at 5, Agent Venom aka Flash Thompson. Flash Thompson is yet another Shattered Heroes recruit. He is a character who has been around for quite some time, first appearing in Amazing Fantasy issue 15 in 1962 during Spider-Man's debut, as a school peer bully of Peter Parker's. He would eventually mature, becoming a close friend of Peter's, learning his secret identity, and eventually joining the US Army after he graduated college. He ended up losing both of his legs in the Iraq War, and turned to alcoholism to deal with his trauma. But eventually the military decided to enlist him again for other means. He would become Agent Venom, bonding with the Venom symbiote, allowing him to use his legs again, all while controlling Venom thanks to a cocktail of drugs. As Agent Venom, he can not only walk again, but he has superhuman strength, agility, reflexes, endurance, and can produce organic webbing. He has an immunity to spider sense, can shapeshift and camouflage to an extent, and can cling to almost any surface, creating his own armor and forming his own limbs. Thompson also left the Secret Avengers in issue 30. Up next at 4, Nova. Nova, the Richard Rider iteration, was a part of the original team of Secret Avengers, leaving during the events of issue 5 of the very first volume. Richard was technically first created by Marv Wolfman in his fanzine Super Avengers in 1966. He wouldn't become a part of the Marvel Universe until 1976 in a story called The Man Called Nova, issue 1. He was meant to be an homage to Spider Man, but a more cosmic version. So, what can Nova do? Well, he is capable of flight, he has superhuman strength, speed, and durability and he can exert influence over gravitational forces, and even open up wormholes. He would also come into possession of the Xandarnian world mind, which allowed him near infinite control over the Nova Force, which gave him the ability to use energy projection and absorption. So in all, not too shabby. Unfortunately, Richard Rider would eventually die during the events of the Thanos Imperative. And our number 3 spot, Beast. Beast aka Hank McCoy was part of the first iteration of Secret Avengers that began in 2010. He is by far one of the most physically intimidating team members thanks to his mutation. But Beast is definitely not just brawn. His character is known for his superior genius level intellect, being a brilliant, well educated individual with a witty sense of humor and a reliable authority on biochemistry and genetics. His mutation gives him an animal esque physiology, enhancing his physical attributes along with giving him sharp claws and teeth. He also employs a unique acrobatic fighting style when in battle. He can jump great distances, and his feet are sensitive enough to detect electronic signals, the likes of listening devices or bombs. Although Hank would depart from the Secret Avengers in issue 37, much like some of his other teammates. Up next, number two, Valkyrie. Another OG member at this number. If we were looking at just the original team members of the Secret Avengers, Valkyrie, aka Brunhild, would have topped our list altogether. And as Guardian Hero, she initially was selected by Odin to lead his personal unit of Shield Maidens, and became known for her prowess in battle. Her powers are based off of her Asgardian physiology. Her body is several times denser than humans, and while she isn't immortal, she ages at a much slower rate than we do. Plus, she's immune to earthly diseases. She has 
has enhanced strength and stamina and is one of the most skilled warriors of the Nine Realms, having extensive training in sword fighting, unarmed combat, and horseback riding, with her natural fighting abilities amongst the best of all Asgardians. She has an enchanted sword called Dragon Fang that was carved from a tooth of an extra dimensional dragon. She can also perceive the approach of death thanks to something called a death glow, an aura of sorts that surrounds a person's body that reveals to her their death is imminent. Valkyrie would eventually depart from the Secret Avengers, also in issue 37 along with Beast. And finally, last but not least, in at 1, The Hulk. The Hulk became a member of the Secret Avengers following the Avengers vs X-Men storyline in the Marvel comics, along with the fight against the Descendants. Shield took control of the Secret Avengers operations, which involved adding new recruits to the team like Mockingbird, Taskmaster, and Hulk himself. They're considered to be the Marvel Now recruits. Anywho, it's pretty obvious why Hulk tops this list. The angrier the Hulk gets, the stronger he gets and the more invulnerable he is. His anger empowerment ability makes him one of the most powerful and straight up strongest individuals in the Marvel Universe in the comics. And it's rare we encounter an individual capable of withstanding his attacks and outmatching his endurance and stamina. He can even survive nuclear attacks and is proven to outlast most other Earth based heroes as seen in a handful of alternate timeline stories in the multiverse. And unlike the rest, the Hulk didn't officially depart the Secret Avengers team, but the last time he was present in the comics as one of their members was in Volume 2 of the series in Issue 15. So number 10, we've got Scarlet Witch. Now, okay, yes, I know, some of you guys out there in the real world, you're gonna defend her and you're gonna say, hey, I know her powers, it's great, that's fantastic. So, let's get a little bit of a backstory here. So the first time we saw her was in 1964 in X-Men number four. She had many appearances in comics over the years and actually, when she first appeared, her first real big problem was that she didn't have really defined powers. That's right. Her powers initially were called hex powers and she could just basically do anything and could cause random events to just happen. She pretty much was a wild card for any tough plot points that the writers had. So some things that she would do is, you know, cause Ultron to short circuit randomly and even cause gas mains to just explode and it wasn't until Kirk Buziak decided that her powers would be all about manipulating chaos. That's when we got a better picture. But however, that didn't really sit well because by the time we got to the Avengers Disassembled series, she pretty much had the ability to warp reality. However, most people identify her as having chaos magic being used to her advantage. What is chaos magic? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Number nine, we got Miss Marvel or Carol Danvers appearing in 1968. Now, in the past, she has had so many problems. As a matter of fact, today she still has a lot. As a matter of fact, most people identify her as Marvel's version of Superman. Pretty much the female version of that. She's got super strength, stamina, all that sort of stuff she can fly. Being half human and half Kree gives her a bunch of different abilities. And when she could fly back in the day, the only way she could do it was through a belt device. She also could tap into the energy of a white hole, which is a reverse black hole, which by the way has never been identified by man at all in, in history. This allowed her to control things like gravity, heat, and many other aspects of different spectrums. This also allowed her to survive in the vacuum of space and she can fly six times the speed of sound and yes she can explode energy out of her hands, fingertips, all that sort of stuff. And apparently she also has the ability of seventh sense. Number eight, you got Hercules. Uh, you know, kind of an old sort of guy, you know what I mean? Debuting in Avengers number 10, 1964. Now he was originally simply a minion of Immortus and he belongs to the Olympian species. Like most, just like Hercules himself, he's got super strength, speed, and stamina. Known to be the strongest of all the Olympians, he could actually apparently pick up a sequoia tree, smash it to bits. It's also originally believed that he even moved the island of Manhattan. However, that was a little too much for comic book writers and they were pretty much like, nah, he was just bluffing. He was just saying, tune the talk, you know what I mean? It wasn't true at all. Ooh. On top of that, he can go 100 miles per hour and go toe to toe with Thor and can withstand, you know, the impacts from bullets. He's kind of another Superman if you really think about it, but his mace itself is kind of like the mace version of Thor's hammer. Thing is, he's backed up by Olympian magic, so nothing like even diseases can hurt him. However, if Zeus takes away his powers, he's pretty much useless. It'd be interesting to see what would happen if Rogue touched him. Hmm. Number seven, you got Black Knight or Dane Whitman. Now, an older adventure dating back 
to around 1967. He's actually the descendant of the original Black Knight comics. He gets his powers mainly from his magic sword. He became the Black Knight after he got his famous winged horse Aragorn. Now he joined the Avengers to defeat Kang the Conqueror originally. You know, he didn't really have any superpowers to begin with. This all changed, however, after he bonded with his teammate Cersei. This was after she was injured and his fellow Eternal named Icarus attempted to stabilize her by merging the two together. He's apparently a good swordsman and can hold up against Captain America and he's a bit of a scientist, understands genetic engineering. His powers might not be a mystery, but he definitely is. Number six, we got Vision. Okay, yeah, we've all seen him. We all know basically he is a robot. Some people identify more or less as a human being, but is made out of, you know, synthetic materials. Okay. Now, what's different about him from the movies is in the comics, he's got a solar jewel on top, which absorbs solar energy, which can actually also discharge energy at any time. He also can fire beams of microwaves and infrared radiation. Very helpful to know. On top of that, he can also become extremely massive. This is confusing because apparently he does this by harnessing the power from some unknown dimension. This also makes him change in density. Being an android means he has super strength and all the other great attributes that other heroes have. As of recent comics, he can also split himself into smaller parts and change shape, but that's good old fashioned nanotechnology at its best. Number five, we got Mantis, probably my least favorite hero that I've ever seen brought to the screen. She's been around since 1973, so you gotta give her some credit there. Her origin though is completely unknown. Literally, she talks about herself in third person person and she says this one came from a place she must not name to reach a place no man must know so I guess you know you don't really know where she's from she also trained in martial arts boom, bomb that's good and she apparently can even or at least almost beat Captain America her biggest and strongest power is obviously using psychic empathy which means she can feel other people's emotions man basically she's Deanna Troy from Star Trek this allows her to figure out also a person Person's weak spot where she can immediately boom knock them out. She's apparently really strong, and with that, she's never ever, well, only once has she ever lost in a hand to hand combat situation. On top of that, she has the ability to meditate and heal herself. In some series, she can even sense the future. Number four, we got Star Fox, and I'm not talking about the good Star Fox. I'm talking about this Star Fox from Marvel. Part of the Eternals group, he appeared first in 1973. Basically, he ages really slowly because he uses cosmic energy. This also makes him extremely hard to hurt because the energy protects him from falls and impacts and other things like that. However, bullets and knives can hurt him, and not just emotionally. However, Star Fox in some series has been able to manipulate gravity using psychokinesis. He also knows apparently 500 alien languages. But his most important power of all is he is capable of activating the pleasure area of enemies' brains, which pretty much helps them calm down so he can win the battle. So I guess you could say, sexiness is his power. Yeah. Number three, we've got Moonlight that appeared in Werewolf by Night number 32. That was hard to say. 1975. Mark Spector is his alter ego. He is human. He's got a lot of similarities between him and Batman. Started off as a boxer, you know, a costumed hero. However, he got his superpowers after he visited an Egyptian moon god. And yes, that means he gets a certain amount of strength depending on the phase of the moon. Apparently, at one point, he even lost his powers because he was disobedient. Yo, you bad moonlight. You said, mmm, and now you're done. I don't know what that means. It's also been said that Moonlight has multiple personalities which make him immune to psychic attacks. He also uses what is known as carbon danium armor, which yes, is not a real armor. This allows him to lock joints and so he can lift more. On top of that, he can jump out of his armor and use it to hold buildings from falling over, which he's done in the past and then he's fought villains in his underwear. Oh yeah. Does not fly anywhere. He has the moon copter, kind of like the bat plane. I don't know why Marvel has not got sued for that. Number two, you got Novar, a rather new superhero debuting in the year 2000 for Marvel Boy number one. Now he is part Kree, part cockroach. 
That's right. He's also a part of the Dark Avengers. Now, because he is half Kree and he has insect DNA, he's got a lot of strength, agility, stamina, that sort of thing. Not as appealing as Spider-Man, though. Nobody really wants to hang out with a cockroach. What his power is, is he can also control his neurological impulses, so he can remove himself from feeling any sort of pain. He can also suppress his emotions, which can hinder him from winning a battle. This is simply known as White Run, where he removes anything from his thoughts. So basically, that cute girl that's in the red dress while he's fighting Thanos. Well, ugh, that girl ain't getting hit on at all. Also, Norvar Salvia can infect people. I mean, like he's a bug. You know, he can scale walls and get into small places because he's triple jointed. Mm hmm. And yes, like a bug, he can digest almost anything which can repair himself. And like most superheroes, he knows science pretty well. Which, for this guy, you know, he helped develop interdimensional travel. I don't know how you do that. But number one, probably the worst of them all, is 3D Man. Oh God. Debuted in 1977 and should have stayed there. Basically the story is Chuck Chandler was captured by the Skrull invaders and he got turned into a two-dimensional being. However, his brother Hal ended up putting on these glasses and could see his brother and if he concentrated hard enough, boom, Chuck materialized into a three-dimensional weird being. Basically done, obviously, through the uh, advancement of radiation, of course. But the thing is, apparently when Hal puts on the glasses, it renders him unconscious, and of course, you know, 3D Man goes to fight the world. 3D Man also has superhero strength, and you know what? I'm just done. That, that has got to be the most ridiculous one of them all. That's the icing on the cake. Number 10, Yondu. Yondu's only showing up on such a low spot on this list because I'm considering this point like kind of a mashup of all three versions. Some are more powerful, some are less. We have the original Yondu of Earth 691, the new Yondu of Earth 616, and of course the MCU Yondu. All are pretty cool characters, but the MCU one is by far the most powerful. It's kind of a combination of all of them too though, in my mind. Yondu in the MCU is depicted as being a Ravager who has a specialized fin that with his whistling allows him to control his Yaka arrow. In the newest version from the comics from Earth 616, Yondu was exiled from his tribe and ended up deciding to abandon his home world of Century 4, becoming a space explorer and a looter. On the Earth of 691, Yondu has no powers and is simply a skilled fighter and gifted sort of mystical empath who ends up returning to his home world after serving as an original Guardians of the Galaxy member to raise a family. Number 9, Kitty Pride. A favorite guest star of mine on the Guardians team is Kitty Pride, who even stood in as their replacement Star-Lord for a while when Quill was off trying to basically be a ruler of Spartax. Kitty got roped into being on the team when she began a long distance relationship with Quill. For a time, the pair were even engaged. Kitty joined the team and became Star-Lord after she had received a power boost from the Black Vortex. It was because of this power boost that Kitty was able to save Spartax, phasing it out of an amber encasing. When Quill became ruler of Spartax, this created tension between the pair as Quill became more and more busy and had less and less time for his and Kitty's relationship. This led Kitty to feel more and more alone and because of this, she would throw herself more and more into her hero work with the Guardians, and would eventually take up Quill's abandoned mantle of Star-Lord. Which I think Quill was also kind of jealous of. Like, he was like, why, why did you take my mantle? Number eight, Groot. When it comes to strength, Groot is likely one of the most powerful guardians to ever have been a member. He hails from Planet X, a Flora Colossi who did not get along with the other members of his race and ended up being kicked off the planet, causing him to wander the galaxy. Poor Groot. Groot, previous to joining the team, had already befriended and fought alongside Rocket Raccoon and Star-Lord, so it was a relatively easy transition for him to join the Guardians of the Galaxy team. Because prior to that, he was already, he was already basically doing that stuff. Number seven, Nova. Nova has been an on and off again member of the team for some time. The Nova we're talking about today, of course, is Richard Ryder. He grew up on Earth and was randomly chosen to become a member of the Nova Corps when he was still a teenager. He has had many adventures with the Guardians of the Galaxy and is currently on the roster in the latest series, volume number six from 2020. Nova is immensely powerful across the board, super strong, super durable, super fast. He can heal, emit energy blasts by channeling the Nova Force and through his connection Connection with the world mind has access to a vast knowledge of Xandarian knowledge, making him super smart as well. 
And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more Guardians lists, I know I want to do more for you, please show us some love by giving this video a thumbs up. Hey! Number six, Cosmo. Cosmo is everyone's favorite psionic space dog, and he's no lightweight when it comes to power levels either. You may recognize this goodest boy from the MCU, where he appeared as an exhibit in the collector's expansive collection. In the comics, Cosmo joined the Guardians as a supporting character and ally for space adventures way back as early as volume two of the series from 2008, kind of the reboot of the Guardians of the Galaxy, if you will. When dealing with the Cancerverse, he proved how formidable of a hero he was when he swiftly took out a bunch of Cancerverse alternate heroes with one single psionic command. Boom. Number five, Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel is likely one of the most powerful cosmic heroes that we have out there, and also for a time ran with the Guardians of the Galaxy. This happened after one of the many times that Carol had lost her memories, or more in this case, I guess like lost the emotional attachment to her memories. It's kind of weird. She was still seen as kind of remembering who people were, but Remembering something important to her and her love of her friends was a little bit more tricky. She didn't really have that emotional connection to people or to her memories. In order to save New York, she was forced to fly high up into the sky. And because she had a tumor in her brain and was told specifically not to fly as she risked dying at the time, she suffered brain damage that affected her memory. In order to learn more about who she truly was inside, she decided to leave Earth for a time and venture among the stars, eventually joining up with the Guardians of the Galaxy. You can check out Carol's cool space adventures and watch her flying high with the Guardians in the 2014 Captain Marvel series, volume number eight, starting in issue two. Also, for anyone that wants to come at me about how many Captain Marvel series there have been and blame Carol for that, look, Carol didn't even come in until I think about halfway through all of those, so just a heads up. People in the comments always want to come after Carol. I love Carol, so I'm gonna fight for her. Civil War II was not her fault. It was just weird writing, guys. It wasn't really her. Number four, Starhawk. Starhawk is one of the members of the original Guardians of the Galaxy roster before they reached mega fame status in the comic book world. But just because some of the older members aren't as well known doesn't mean they don't deserve to be celebrated or respected. Some of them are evidently very, very powerful. Starhawk is one such guardian, although not my favorite of the oldest original team members. We still don't even fully know the limits of Starhawk's power, but what we do know is that he has a multiversal knowledge that grants him great insight. He was basically living the same life cycle and using that knowledge way before Moira McTaggart made it cool. It is because of this that he knows so much about the world around him, giving him sort of a precognitive sense. Starhawk is also super strong, super fast, and immortal. Number three, Thor. Yep, when Thor joined the team in the MCU, he even made reference to another version of the Guardians of the Galaxy roster referred to as the Asgardians of the Galaxy. This is what Thor jokingly refers to the team as in the film, but it's actually also the name of a separate team from the comics. There's a real Asgardians of the Galaxy comic. It's got like a totally different team pretty much, but you should check it out. We don't know in the MCU if Thor will end up staying on as a permanent member of the Guardians, but sometimes the strongest members to this team are the ones that come and go. Thor is one of the most powerful heroes in the Marvel Universe, definitely in the MCU as well. He even attempted to go toe to toe with Null during the King in Black event recently and impressively held his own, even managing to get a hit in where he smashed off Null's jaw. I was like, what just happened? That fight was crazy. We also got to see Storm and Thor team up. Ugh, so good. Number two, Star-Lord. Star-Lord typically isn't known for being the most powerful member of the Guardians of the Galaxy, despite the fact that he is one of the most recognizable members, thanks to the films and recent comics, and is generally the leader of the team, or, or is generally depicted as being the leader of the team. However, recently he's got a major power upgrade. While thought dead, it turned out that he had survived the fight against the Olympians and the explosion that had been thought to have killed him. Instead, he was transported to another dimension and another world entirely. There, his element guns seemed to have an everlasting power source, something that would be useful on his return. For Quill, almost 200 years had passed, though of course, probably in part thanks to his Spartax heritage, he looked as though he had barely aged upon his return. Also, you know, maybe time Time moves differently in another dimension. There's a lot of good explanations for that. His element gun was used to defeat one of Null's symbiote dragons, and he also managed to withstand a mental assault from Null, who tried to drag him and the Guardians into the darkness. 
Number one, Adam Warlock. Obviously, Adam Warlock had to make the top of this list. He's one of the most powerful characters in the Marvel Universe, and even though we haven't seen him for a while, he's still out there, lurking, with lots of power still to boot, even, you know, without the Soul Stone. Adam Warlock has been capable in the past of manipulating the very fabric of reality. He's been on a god level before. I mean, he still kinda is. When we saw the new Guardians team in the comics, Adam Warlock joined up with them to defeat Ultron, and then ultimately ended up joining the team. Together they set out on a great task to repair the universe. That sounds like a lot of work. Coming in at number 10, we got Cosmic Ghost Rider. And before you ask, yes, he is just as cool as he sounds. Cosmic Ghost Rider is actually Frank Castle from an alternate dimension. And he has a few classic Ghost Rider abilities such as generating hellfire and the penance there. But this incarnation of Ghost Rider can also manipulate cosmic energy thanks to Galactus. Oh, and he's immortal, so you know, he's in it for the long haul. Number nine, Kitty Pride. Kitty, a mutant and originally a member of the X-Men, ended up joining the Guardians of the Galaxy later on in her superhero career. I mean, imagine being part of the X-Men and Guardians. I mean, that's so darn cool. She also married one of the most famous Guardians ever, Star-Lord himself, Peter Quill. And when Peter left to become king of the new Spartax Empire, Kitty took on the mantle of Star-Lord. She can also use her powers to phase through solid objects and in the Days of Future Past comic storyline, she was able to phase her own consciousness into her younger self in the past. Okay, if that's not powerful, then I have no idea what is. Number eight, Captain Marvel. Carol Danvers was a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy. She wasn't there very long, but she was there. Carol Danvers joined the team when she lost her memory. Being on the team really, you know, it kind of, it helped her grow into the hero we know and love. Also, having super strength, super speed, flight, and vulnerability, energy absorption, energy projection, energy manipulation, regeneration, healing, and hyper cosmic awareness might help out the team, you know, just a, just a tiny little bit. And by a little bit, I mean a lot. Like seriously, I wouldn't want to mess with her. Number seven, Iron Man. Yeah. You heard me. Oh wait, wait, did you did you not hear me? I, I said Iron Man, sorry, you know, that confusion, I'm new, so. Iron Man, AKA Tony Stark, joined the team during the Marvel Now run. He even had a brand new fancy suit for the occasion. Iron Man armor number 45 to be exact. And yes, I am always exact. It was designed so he could fly through space without any weird complications because you know space, they, it has a ton of those. The suit was powered by multiple repulsor tech cores and can shoot repulsor rays, you know, create force fields, and has a new AI, Pepper. <laughs> Man, I wonder why he called it that. Number six, Adam Warlock. Adam was created as the perfect being. Man, like what a hard thing to live up to. Imagine everyone telling you that you had to be perfect. I mean, it would be hard on anyone. He was created by a group called the Enclave and was the first step toward creating a race of humans who would one day rule the earth. But, and it's a big but, he rebelled and turned against them and went off on his own, as they usually do. And his powers include enhanced strength, stamina, agility. He can manipulate cosmic energy. He eventually got the soul gem though and became even more powerful. So, you know, there's that as well. Number five, Drax the Destroyer. Drax also called Arthur Douglas, was actually born in California. He was married, he had a daughter, but one day they were just traveling through the desert, you know, just on a nice family trip, and saw a spaceship above them. Spoiler alert, it was Thanos. So Thanos did what he does best, and killed Arthur and his family. Wow, Thanos, just wow. A dude named Mentor, who was monitoring Thanos, showed up and called upon Kronos to merge Arthur's consciousness into a body with superhuman powers, thus, creating Drax the Destroyer. Now, his mission is to kill Thanos. He also ended up joining the Guardians of the Galaxy to help with that. Number four, Groot. I am Groot. I am Groot. I am Groot. Now, okay, if you didn't understand that, all I said was Groot is a tree-like alien being who originated on a planet called Planet X. Everyone thought they were wiped out, but it turns out they weren't. He's one of the founding members of Star-Lord's team and has a wide array of powers. He's super strong. He can create miniature copies of himself. So, you know, if he gets destroyed, you know, he's all good because they retain all his memories. It's just like backing up your hard drive in a sense. And you know, he's also super durable because he is a tree. Oh yeah. And he says, I am Groot, but I mean, that's just his language. So, you know, don't judge him on that. Number three, 
Rocket Raccoon. I mean, his name is a pretty good description. He is a raccoon, but not a normal one. He originated from the planet Half World, which was a home to an insane asylum. In order to keep the patients happy, they genetically altered their pets to kind of give them human intelligence in a way. What? That's so weird. But Rocket became sheriff on that planet and had a ship called the Rack and Ruin, which he used to travel the stars. He's also a master of weapons and building things, so if you or anyone you know need a cool weapon, he's your guy. I mean, Raccoon. Number two, Gamora. Gamora is Thanos' adopted daughter. She is the last of her species and Thanos rescued her and took her in as a kid and basically trained her to become the most feared woman in the, I don't know, universe? She is arguably one of the best martial artists in the Marvel Universe, which allows her to even take on people who are like way stronger than her. But you know, she's also very strong and has even taken on Thanos from time to time. <laughs> And she can heal really fast, uh, she's, she is fast, and she is a master with weapons. You know, now I can kind of tell why she's called the most feared woman in the universe. Number one, Star-Lord. Peter Quill is a human-alien mix. His father was from Spartax. His father came to Earth, had a relationship with his mother, Meredith Quill. But then she was killed by someone named Badoon because, you know, he didn't want them together. He then started to travel space and protect people from Badoon. You know, he doesn't have any superpowers, but... He is fast, you know, he's great in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and he has a ton of cool gadgets. So I honestly, I wouldn't feel bad for him. He's, he's doing all right. Number 10, Cosmo. Starting off our list today with the goodest of boys, Cosmo the dog. Cosmo was originally a test animal used by the Soviets during the space race between the Soviet Union and the United States in the 1960s. He was launched into orbit around Earth, but drifted a bit off course and found himself in nowhere. And thanks to the exposure of cosmic rays, he developed telepathic and telekinetic powers. Although he doesn't look like much, you definitely shouldn't let your guard down around him, because with these powers he can create shields and deflect energy-based attacks, as well as project mind blast at enemies. He has straight up gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Adam Warlock, so like, you know, he's pretty tough. Cosmo doesn't become an official member of the Guardians of the Galaxy until after the team disbanded after they allied with Thanos, and many of them died. Just before Star-Lord died, he left Cosmos with a task to collect the greatest heroes in the universe to form a band of Annihilators. The team Star-Lord believed was what the Guardians of the Galaxy should have been. Cosmo one by one convinced the Silver Surfer, Gladiator, Beta Ray Bill, Quasar, and Ronan the Accuser to team up and protect the universe together, as was Star-Lord's final wish. Give this good boy sorry read for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 2008's Nova Volume 4 number 8, or just feel free to skip ahead to his time as a Guardian in 2009's Guardians of the Galaxy number 12. Number 9, Moon Dragon. Heather Douglas, daughter of Drax the Destroyer, was found by Thanos' father, Mentor, who took her to his homeworld Titan to be raised by the Titanian Shaolorn monks in their monastery. While there, Heather studied the Titan's way and disciplines to unlock her latent psychic potential and gained her mental and physical powers. However, she came under the influence of a powerful entity called the Dragon of the Moon, and she believed she had resisted it, which filled her with pride, and she took the name Moon Dragon as a result. Sadly, it also made Moon Dragon an incredibly arrogant lady who more than once has tried to quote unquote fix things by controlling the minds of people. While she's not that bad now, Moon Dragon still has the ability to rub folks the wrong way. However, she still has a major telepathic power that can be a quite valuable to any team. Not only that though, Heather is also a top-notch fighter who's trained with some of the best warriors in the entire galaxy. The fact that she can know how an opponent is going to act aids immensely in a fight. And then also for a time, she had the ability to straight up just transform into an actual huge flying dragon, which is so sick, but she seems to have lost that ability somewhere down the road. Moon Dragon joined up with the team in Guardians of the Galaxy number 12, along alongside Cosmo the Space Dog, but only after dying first. During the events of the Annihilation Conquest event, Moon Dragon is killed when Ultron shoves his arm just through her chest. In order to resurrect her, Phyla and Drax are killed by Mentor so they can travel to the Realm of the Dead and retrieve her. Phyla is able to save her just in time and the three return to the Land of the Living. Moon Dragon then returns to nowhere with Phyla and Drax where she is accepted as a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Check out her story for yourself starting with 1973's Iron Man number 54. Number 8, Drax. Now speaking of Drax, let's talk about him for a sec. Originally Drax was a human named Arthur Douglas who was killed alongside his family by Thanos. His spirit was resurrected by Kronos into the body of Drax to become a being powerful enough to take out Thanos. In his new body, he was far superior to a human with the ability to fly, project energy blasts from his hands, he possesses enhanced 
enhanced strength and could heal from pretty much any injury. That being said though, he has shifted many, many times character wise over the years, going back and forth between smart and dumb, large and average, all until the Annihilation event where he was portrayed as smaller but much more intelligent. And that's actually the version that we're all familiar with today. Although he's not as super strong as he once was, he still is powerful and can hold his own against multiple enemies. He still heals very quickly from injuries and has enhanced senses to the point where he was able to sniff out a Skrull imposter. He also now has the tendency to look before he leaps and in a recent attempt at pacifism, dropped his entire standing as a warrior completely. However, Drax still has to count as a major member of the Guardians who, if pressed to it, will remind people why he's called Drax the Destroyer. Check out his entire story for yourself because it is a great one, starting with 1973's Iron Man number 55. Number 7, The Thing. Although Ben Grimm, aka The Thing, is normally associated with the Fantastic Four, he did spend some time with the Guardians of the Galaxy and for the sweetest and just most wholesome reason, to fulfill his lifelong dream of being an astronaut. Okay, fine, you caught me, that wasn't the entire reason. Ben did decide he needed a break from Earth during a period of time where Reed and Sue were lost in time. But I swear, the other reason is part of it too. Now sadly, Ben's time with the Guardians wasn't too long as during the second superhuman civil war, their ship was accidentally destroyed in a fight, stranding the Guardians on Earth, which kind of forced them to disappear ban for a while. Now in terms of power, The Thing is one of the strongest characters in the Marvel Universe. He's faced off with the Hulk multiple times and survived, and even once beat him with the help of his friends, and has consistently clobbered the Fantastic Four's enemies time and time again. Aside from his strength and durability though, Grimm is an expert pilot and military tactician, which really sets him apart from many other members on this team. That being said though, there are other members of the team who outclass Ben in many other ways, which is why he's not higher on this list today. Check him out for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1961's Fantastic Four, or just skip ahead to 2015's Guardians of the Galaxy number 1 to see him in action in space. Number 6, Agent Venom. Oh yeah, you heard me right, Flash Thompson, the guy who treated Peter Parker terribly in high school, was at one time a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Now obviously he wasn't just a regular old human being sent up into space, by this time he had been bonded to the Venom symbiote for quite some time and was known as Agent Venom, so he was actually a somewhat useful and valuable member of the team. He was placed onto the team by the Avengers to work as an agent between Earth and the rest of the cosmos, and although he was amazed by the vastness of space, he actually managed to handle this role quite well. Flash was so useful on the team because the Venom symbiote has the ability to retain superpowers of anyone it's bonded with, so it already had a ridiculous amount of powers by the time Flash was bonded with it, and you know, went into space. In addition to many of the powers possessed by Spider-Man, it also gave Flash the ability to produce toxins, camouflage, form two legs to replace Flash's amputated ones, create weapons out of itself, and just so much more. Through their adventures, the true origin of the symbiote was revealed, and once it was finally healed, Flash became able to tap into its full potential. Check out Flash Thompson as Agent Venom for yourself, starting with Flash's first appearance in 1962 Amazing Fantasy number 15, or skip ahead to 2014's Guardians of the Galaxy Free Comic Book Day. Number 5, Groot. Now, I'll start off this one with something that I didn't know was a thing. Groot actually has a very complicated history in Marvel Comics, as he was originally a villain who came to Earth with the intent of capturing humans to experiment on them. It wasn't until the 2006 crossover event Annihilation Conquest where he was given a redesign into the more heroic character that we all know and love today. And then it would take another two years before he would join the Guardians of the Galaxy in 2008's Guardians of the Galaxy number one. Now, for the most part, Groot has been portrayed as comic relief, especially in recent years. But in a fight, trust me, he is a serious threat. Groot has a number of superhuman qualities that make him a vital member of the team. I mean, as a living tree, he can manipulate plant life and has the ability to grow his limbs to suit his needs. His ability to do this increases his mass whenever necessary, which also increases his durability in the process. This also allows for rapid healing slash regrowth whenever he's damaged or honestly feels necessary to separate parts of himself to accomplish a task. It's often hinted that Groot holds himself back a lot and hasn't shown his full abilities at all. A great example of that being in Secret Wars when, as a toothpick, he merges into the world tree to become a massive figure that stops Doctor Doom. Check out Groot's story for yourself, starting with his very first appearance as King Groot in 1960's Tales of Astonish number 13, or skip ahead to Annihilation Conquest Star-Lord number 1. Number 4, Starhawk. Stakar of the House of Ogard, aka Starhawk, was a human who was raised as an Arcturan who was cursed to re-inhabit his infant body and relive his life over and over and over again. When he did this, he would be reborn with his past knowledge intact, which led to him referring to himself as one who knows, though much of his past memories would manifest in a more precognitive sense rather than just full-blown memories. His powers aren't really fully known, but he is believed to be pretty much immortal, or at least able to live for an unknown period of time. He can also manipulate light into solid forms, fly at light speeds, survive 
in the vacuum of space and possesses superhuman strength and durability and has more knowledge than any living being should have thanks to his undying curse. It's actually been indicated that the character is much stronger than he lets on as he took on the cosmic powered Korvac in battle and lived to tell the tale. After his undying curse was finally lifted, this mysterious figure was responsible for forming the first Guardians team and kept the cosmos safe for honestly quite some time. Give his story a read for yourself starting with his introduction in 1975 Defenders number 27. Number 3 Adam Warlock With his first appearance going back as far as 1967 with the publication of Fantastic Four number 66, Adam Warlock has quite the extensive history when it comes to Marvel. Since his introduction, Adam Adam has played a pivotal role in many of Marvel's biggest storylines and events, and he has been a member of the Infinity Watch and even possessed the Infinity Gauntlet for a time. But that's not what we're here to talk about today, we are talking about him and the Guardians of the Galaxy. But before we do that, let's talk powers. In terms of powers, Adam Warlock is very high on the cosmic scale. He has a standard set of superhuman qualities including strength, stamina, speed, agility, and durability. And then additionally, he has energy manipulation and absorption powers, is an expert in the use of magic, and can manipulate matter. He joined the Guardians for a while in Guardians of the Galaxy number 1 in 2008 alongside Star-Lord and the other members of the modern team. As of Cosmic being of immense power, he's easily one of the most powerful members of the Guardians of the Galaxy to date. Now if you're not familiar with him, check him out in his very first appearance in Fantastic Four number 66 as him, or skip ahead to 1972's Marvel premiere number 1 to get just a little bit more of a backstory on him. Number 2, Angela. Interestingly enough, this character didn't start off as a Marvel character. Angela was originally created by Neil Gaiman and Todd McFarlane for Spawn, having first appeared in Spawn number 9 in 1993. She was first picked up by Marvel Comics for an introduction into the Marvel Universe in 2013's Age of Ultron crossover story, and was developed further in the original Sin storyline that took place in the following year. Her backstory was revamped to make her the long lost daughter of Odin and Freya, making her Thor's older sister. Joining the Guardians of the Galaxy's roster in 2014's Guardians of the Galaxy number 9, Angela proved time and time again that she truly was Thor's sister, as she is definitely comparable in terms of power. Angela has both the powers inherent to an Asgardian as well as those possessed by an angel of the 10th realm. These traits make her immortal, give her the ability to fly, and afford her superhuman strength, agility, stamina, speed, reflexes, and endurance. She is also a master of hand-to-hand -hand combat and melee weapon combat, and has demonstrated these abilities in conflict against the likes of Spawn, Thor, and honestly so much more. That being said though, she does have a, just a little bit of an ego, and that can and has been her downfall just a few times. But all things considered, having a warrior as strong as Thor with a much darker edge on your team is a pretty huge asset. Check her out in her first appearance in the Marvel Universe in 2013's Age of Ultron, number 10. Number 1, Captain Marvel. Now I'm sure we all know who Carol Danvers is, especially in recent years she, since she has not only appeared in the MCU and the Avengers franchise, but also got her own solo movie. She first appeared in Marvel Super Heroes number 13 in 1968, and from that first appearance she has evolved into a number of different character identities, including Miss Marvel, Binary, Warbird, and Captain Marvel, which is the name she goes by now. If you're not familiar with her powers, let me give you a bit of a rundown. Now like most superheroes, she possesses super strength, stamina, agility, durability, and can fly. But that's not all because she also possesses vast cosmic awareness, has a slight regenerative healing factor, and can manipulate energy to do pretty much anything she puts her mind to. What's even crazier is that like many of the other characters on this list today, it's also said that she has not shown the full potential of her powers either. Meaning she can only get stronger from here, which I can't even fathom. She joined up with the Guardians of the Galaxy alongside Agent Venom in 2014's Guardians of the Galaxy Free Comic Book Day, and although her time with them was pretty short, she she was a huge asset for the team. Now it was so short because she is a military gal so she's sometimes classed with her laid back attitude and also because as a woman who's used to being the leader, she didn't really like playing second fiddle to Star Lord. Nowadays Carol sticks to hanging around Earth but her tenure on the team gave the Guardian some serious firepower to say the least. Check her out in her first appearance in 1968's Marvel Super Heroes number 13. 